Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today in the lab, a rather special classic Commodore 64. There's nothing special about this from the outside, really, but this has been repaired by one of the last people who did this in Germany professionally, Uwe Peters, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, I think uh, two years ago or something. And he was the last person to work on this and he actually fixed it, but it broke down again and the owner of this kindly donated this to me, Robert, thank you very much. And I'm going to see if I can fix this again and make it a working C64. One special thing is that I have the whole conversation uh, between Robert and Uwe Peters, who was the repair person who worked on this and uh, everything he did. This had a kernel switcher installed, that's why it has the holds here, I think, and a reset switch, which wasn't uncommon at all at the time. There's actually a little sticker from Electronic Technik Peters, Uwe Peters repair shop, and it actually isn't too far away from where I live now and where I grew up. So I didn't know that this existed at all, that there was someone repairing C64 so close to where I grew up when I had a 64. But my C64 never broke down, never had any issues. So probably that's why I didn't know about this. The things that were faulty in this was the 8701. Uwe Peters also replaced the Vic2 chip, it seems and then it was a matter of a broken kernel. Let me just interrupt this video for a couple of seconds to thank the sponsor who made this possible, PCBWay. They are a manufacturer of prototype PCBs, so if you need any circuit boards made for your project, I highly recommend checking them out. They offer very good quality for extremely reasonable prices, and they also have excellent service. So check out PCBWay, the link is in the video description. Back to the C64. So I'm going to open this up at first and have a look at what it looks like from the inside. Obviously. <laughs> and then I'll see what I can do. Allegedly this has a black screen, which is the most common fault. Uh, many faults result in a black screen. And Robert, who donated this, actually did some basic troubleshooting already. Said that the voltages are alright. Some things he checked looked good on the scope. So, yeah, we're going to see. This might be a tricky, tricky one. <laughs> but I'm really looking forward to that. As, as I said repeatedly on this channel, the Commodore 64 is just my favorite system to work on and probably the one I know most about. So this is a 250425 board, basically the third major revision of the Commodore 64. Probably one of my favorite versions to work on, but uh, also a version that failed quite a lot. So as you can see, the kernel ROM is socketed, as was to be expected, because it had a kernel switcher of some description in here. The other two chips that are socketed, which are commonly socketed, are the SID chip and the VIC-2. This seems to have a 6581 revision 4 AR SID chip in here, which is the, I think some people say AR stands for advanced resonance. I'm not sure about that. It's just a special revision of the SID chip, basically. These were most commonly used in later C64 models and also in the first Commodore 128 models, actually. These sound quite a bit different from the regular SID chips. Kind of a rare SID chip, so that is kind of a pleasant surprise to find one in here. Hope this still works. So I can't see any immediate signs of warning. Uh, burnt components or black traces or anything like that. So I'm just going to try to power this on and see what it does. So I have my TV hooked up here and Yeah, we just get a black screen. Yeah, let's try Let's try if it does anything with the dead test cartridge, which is specifically made for C64s with a black screen because this tests things before most of the rest of the system powers on. Um, it works on C64s with broken RAM, and I think Noel's Retro Lab did a video and tested this with the C64 with all the RAM chips removed, actually, and it still 
did something. It flashes the screen to show you the broken RAM. <laughs> so it should do something if the processor is working, if the PLA is working. It overrides the kernel ROM actually and the, the other ROMs. It has its own character ROM built in. So if uh, most of the chips are broken, this should still display a picture. Otherwise, it might hint to the processor being broken or the PLA being completely broken. Could be that something else is shorting out if this doesn't work, but it's highly unlikely. If the RAM doesn't work, this usually gives me a reading. So, and it takes some seconds for this to boot up before it does anything, but this, apart from giving me a signal that the screen can lock on, displays 50 hertz PAL signal there, which is uh, displayed by my upscaler box there. It doesn't do anything. It's basically a black, very, very black, severely dead <laughs> Commodore 64 screen. Yeah, that test doesn't work. That means that there could be, there could still be quite some things wrong. I suspect the PLA or the processor. I've not seen many of these PLA chips fail, actually. The later revisions are usually pretty reliable, at least not the most common thing to fail in this, these 64s. I've seen the processor fail quite a few times more, actually. The first revisions of the PLA chip produced by MLS, which at that point belonged to Commodore, where famously they had some of the chemicals wrong in the insulation layer. I think there was too much boron in there or something like that. And basically the, the chips ate themselves over time, so they just stopped working after some time, no matter what you did, <laughs> because the die was damaged and the circuits inside the chip were damaged by the chemicals. These later versions don't have that problem, I think. I want to measure some voltages first, if the voltages get to the board. But if we get a lock on the picture from the VIC-2, probably tells me that the timing chip is okay, and the VIC-2 should be halfway okay if it at least displays something or outputs a signal that the TV can interpret. So I'm just going to take the board out to have it easier to work on this. This uh, probably will be a bit trickier than just getting the voltages. So several voltage rails to check. I usually get the main supply voltages on the user port here. This is our 5 volts rail. It's at 4.95. That should be okay. And the AC, you can basically see these indentations here, or these cuts. These are, here's the AC voltage from the power supply, which is a bit more than the 9 volts that are specified. This is my homemade power supply, so that's normal. And on this cut, we have the five volts that supplies most of the chip's voltages. We also have two voltage regulators. This is a 7805, which supplies the VIC-2 chip and the SID chip with cleaner voltages that are actually generated by these on board. There's also 7812, which supplies, also supplies the VIC-2 and the SID chip specifically with the voltages they need to operate. And we should have 12 volts spot on here, which we do. And we should have 5 volts here, which we do. Yes. So our voltage rails all seem to be all right. I don't know yet if anything arrives at the chips. Usually you can just feel the chips a bit. And if they get warm, they get the voltages. We can also de determine by this uh, finger test if any of the chips gets too hot. The kernel actually gets pretty warm. The kernel definitely gets too warm. So I'm going to pull that and try the dead test again as my first step. That gets too hot. That's Maybe that's broken. These uh, mask ROMs from MOS are not that great actually and they fail quite frequently. I have quite a few of these broken lying around. Let's try the dead test again without the kernel. So, kernel removed. Let's try the dead test card. Yeah, and we get a flash. 
Okay, so the kernel was bringing the whole system down. But there's more broken stuff on here and this is one flash that points me to a RAM issue here. Another thing I always do is to try if we get the same blinking signal, flashing screen signal with every power on. Yeah, we still get one flash. I have a PDF of the original manual for the dead test cartridge here. And it says that one flash on the AB revisions of the C64, which this is, it means that U12 is the one that should be broken. So I'm just going to desolder U12 and put in a known working RAM chip, I guess. I also took out the SID chip and I get the exact same flashing screen with the dead test. Sometimes if uh, these chips short out, they can bring down the whole system so that the dead test doesn't even start up. And I think that happened with our kernel ROM in this case, which seems to be totally shorted, which also would explain why it got hot so quickly. The SID chip is not needed to boot up the system, so I'm just going to leave it out now to not damage it because it's quite a rare one and I don't want to risk anything with that. I'm going to desolder U12, which is this one. And it seems like at least two of these RAM chips have been replaced before, one of them being U12. Maybe we have a broken trace there even. These two are different than all the other ones. So maybe they were broken before. It still doesn't want to quite come out and to not damage the board any more than necessary. I'm just using hot air from this side of the board and try if I can get it fully loose. Which is a trick that I use more often since I have my hot air station set up on the bench here and don't have to set it up each time I want to use it. There we go. Just freeing up the holes with sort of wick. And it's always worth to take your time with these repairs because these traces on these older boards easily lift. And I'm going to put a socket in. There don't seem to be any damaged traces on this. So let's quickly check this. No, it's all good. Basically, the, the chips are all connected in series, so you can just measure from uh, one of the holes here to the next chip, and you're going to be sure that there's continuity, and then there's a ground pin and a voltage supply pin. So, putting in a socket here. So this should be a known good RAM chip from my stash. Let's see what it does. Ooh. And it still has the same RAM chip showing as faulty. That means probably something else is faulty. What fun. <laughs> With RAM faults like that, where the dead test shows me a random RAM fault, basically, I suspect that we might have a fault in one of the multiplexer chips, which are 74LS257 chips. And uh, in some cases, these are MOS branded parts with a different part number that I don't know off the top of my head, but the MOS logic replacement chips are really prone to failure and you should probably replace them right away. These are not MOS, but I'm still suspecting, kind of suspecting this chip here. So I hooked up my oscilloscope and I'm going to probe around on this for a bit while the RAM test of the dead test card is running, which is the initial test that gives me the flashing screen. So we should see signals coming here. That is the, that's how the signal, what, what I would suspect. 
the signals to look like on this. Oh, look at that. That looks pretty bad, actually. Already <laughs> the second pin I probed at all. Yeah, these all look reasonable. So this is pin 14 on that chip. That doesn't look right because we don't have a proper square wave going on there. It's sloped quite a bit and that's not, not a signal that's going to be interpreted right. Usually you have like highs and lows like on the other pins. It, it should look like something like this. So where we have defined highs and lows, the highs are TTL highs, so they are at around 5 volts or something a little bit lower than 5 volts, which is exactly what we see here. And the lows are uh, ground, basically. So it might be this chip, uh, or it might be something leading to this chip. Oh, and look at that, we have the same signal on the PLA. I'd rather suspect the PLA in this case. So we got the same wonky signal with the sloped trace there on pin 14 on this and on pin 27 on the PLA chip. So one of these might be the issue here. I am going to probe around some more and see if I can see some other difficult signals, but that might very well be the cause of the problem that we have now. Yeah, and that's pin uh, 14 on the other multiplexer chip. That's how it's supposed to look. I think I want to pull up some schematics here and see what these pins actually are. And what a surprise, the two pins are actually directly connected to each other. And on the PLA, pin 27 is address line 12. So we should have the same line going from the processor as well. And on the processor we have address line 12 on pin 19. So let's check that pin on the scope as well. And I tend to mark things. So I painted the pin red. Yeah, it's of course it's the same because they are just interconnected. Oh, and there's another one that looks kind of wonky. That's A13. The other address lines look okay. Yeah, A13 and A12 look kind of wonky. This is A13 and A12. So, yeah, the address buses are, of course, going through the whole system, basically. But my money is on this multiplexer chip because the dead test card does its thing, which it usually doesn't if the processor is severely damaged or if the PLA is severely damaged. And also, this is the easiest thing to desolder. So, I'm just going to try that and desolder this and try to replace it with a good one. <laughs> So I desoldered my logic chip there. Let's see if that changes the behavior. The system is inoperable basically now because it can't access the RAM correctly, but uh, maybe we can see the trace on the scope still. No, nope, it's still wonky. Yeah, that's still the exact same thing. So I suspect my logic chip was all right. So I actually probed around a bit and had a look at the schematics that I have from the programmer's reference guide. I think that's what it's called in English. I have the German version, obviously. So it turns out that my two wonky signals that I found are on opposite pins on the PLA. Pin 27 is address line 12 and pin 2 is address line 13, actually. So it might just be a coincidence, but Something tells me that it might be the PLA that's broken in this case. And yeah, I'm just going to try to replace that with the working one or with the replacement, whatever I find first in my stash. <laughs> so let's disorder this and replace it with a good one and see if that changes the behavior. <laughs> So I put an XC PLA in there that Felix donated a while back when I was building my 60 clone board. And this was the first one I found. I have a couple of other replacements and I'm probably going to do 
a PLA replacement shootout thing video at some point because I have quite a few accumulated and there's quite a few options. Let's try what this does with the replacement PLA in it. Okay, fingers crossed everybody. Let's see. Oh, we get another signal now. That's five flashes. That's, that's I would say that's a step forward at least. <laughs> Better than nothing. And five flashes according to my list in the dead test manual here is going to point us to U10. So it seems likely that another RAM chip is broken because there were two replaced ones in here and usually RAM chips from the same batch have the same issues. <laughs> so yeah, maybe that's worth a try. I want to have a look at the signals on the scope first. Oh, and it's still the same. Look at that. Wow, we still have wonky signals on both A13 and A12. That's really strange. Let's see what else interfaces with this. And we still have our dead test just doing the flashing, which is kind of weird because usually if the system halfway works, if the processor works and things like that, the dead test is just going to start up with the normal screen and starting the tests. If only the RAM was broken, that would be more likely to happen, I think. This thing is kind of stubborn. <laughs> so I should probably take a look at the processor before I do anything else, because the signal originates there, basically. We need kind of a miracle here. I think might be the 6510 processor, even though I said at the beginning that it was not very likely. But these do fail. The address bus 12 and 13 also pass through the ROMs, so maybe there's something wrong with the ROMs. That could be another explanation. Yeah, here, here it is on the kernel ROM, but the kernel ROM is not even in there. So that can't really be the problem. Yeah, and it's also on the basic ROMs. And of course, it comes from the processor. Would be very strange if only that part of the processor was broken. I guess let's desolder the CPU as well. Wow, so this turns out to be more complicated than I had anticipated, as usual. <laughs> so the old PLA, the original PLA gives me one flash again. <laughs> so there's something off with the PLA timings on the replacement, I guess. But we still, this still doesn't solve our problem, obviously. <laughs> And as a replacement, I'm going to put in an 8500, which is just a newer manufacturing process than the 6510, but otherwise it's completely compatible. So this should do fine. If that was the fault. Let's see. Okay, moment of truth. Nope. <laughs> Oh, wow, okay. The exact same behavior with the new processor. And as you can see, we still get the exact same wonky signals. This is, uh, yeah, A12 and A13. Otherwise, yeah, usually these fail in a way so that the dead de test doesn't do anything at all. So that's, yeah, that was kind of to be expected. Yeah, it could be a number of things still, but yeah, I think I just want to probe around a bit more and see. I put a new kernel ROM in here, or a new old stock kernel ROM, and that didn't change anything at all, too, so, hmm. So, I found another RAM chip that might be very wonky. It's actually nearly too hot to touch, the others barely get warm. This might be a shorted RAM chip, so maybe our whole problem is just one shorted RAM chip that I overlooked. And our dead test is kind of right, even though it's pointing me to the wrong RAM chip. But as I said, there have been replacements here, so 
And this one definitely gets a lot warmer than the others, which points me to something being shorted internally there. And that might... that's not good, at least. Let's say uh, it's not good at first. Maybe that even is responsible for bringing our address line down there. Maybe it's just down to some broken RAM. And it might just be there's more RAM faults in this. Maybe I'm just going to go in and replace all the RAM. I think what I want to do is to also have a look at the ROMs because there's where the data lines also go to, at least this um, basic ROM. The kernel ROM I replaced with a known good one and that still has the wonky signal on one pin, obviously. It had the wonky signal on the pin when uh, there was no chip in there. So maybe this could be an issue or maybe it's just another RAM issue. That might also very well be at this point. Uh, no idea why the address lines would be looking so strange with broken RAM alone. The wonky address lines are not directly present on the RAM, so hmm, they are on this. So the C64 was a bit stubborn. It is the next day and I slept over it and I came to the conclusion that I wanted to test a working C64 and look at the address line signals that I thought would be wonky. And yeah, let me show you. So I'm probing the signals on the working C64 and these are address line 12 and 13. Yeah, and apart from there being activity, we have the same slope going on there that I thought was a wonky signal. And this C64 works. So yeah, I was a bit on the wrong track there. It was kind of a red herring kind of thing. I apologize. So I decided to focus on the RAM chips actually at first because that's what the dead test indicates after all. So I'm just going to go in and replace the RAM chip that the dead test points to and see if that helps. It might still be the basic ROM is wonky and uh, brings down something, but I suspect it might just be RAM. So let's see. So the RAM chip in question that is also indicated by the one flash of the dead test cartridge is this one, U10. So let me just replace this and see if it takes us anywhere. Okay, another round of testing. Are we happy now, Commodore 64? It probably wasn't that RAM chip, we still get the exact same result. But it's always the same indication here. That's kind of strange. Hmm. I have another suspect. Uh, this 74LS258 is also connected to the RAM and is also kind of a regular fault when it comes to strange readings from RAM tests. And yeah, that's U14. This is my test C64, so this one works and it runs the dead test. So I put a socket in for the basic ROM and a socket for the 74LS258 chip. And I'm going to populate them with new chips. So I've populated uh, a new basic ROM and that's actually a newly produced uh, 74LS258 chip. Let's try if that changes anything. Nope. <laughs> same old, same old. That's kind of disheartening. <laughs> so probably the next step would be to replace all the remaining RAM chips. Otherwise, I'm pretty much stumped at this point. So I think what I want to do next is to replace all the RAM chips. The one flash we saw is actually U12, which we already replaced. That probably hasn't to do anything with anything. U12 is this one here. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, so I socketed all the RAM chips and put new RAM chips that I know to be good in. And imagine my surprise when I found that we get the exact same behavior. <laughs> it's uh, close to zero at this point, my surprise. So um, I poked around with the oscilloscope a bit more. And let me show you this. So the reset circuitry in the Commodore 64, basically the, there's a 556 timer chip that uh, basically is responsible for producing a delay on this pin, pin uh, nine. And then it is passed on to this 7406 chip. The signal is coming in on pin 13, which is uh, on the right side of the chip, so the second from the top, and it is passed on by the output on pin 12 to the processor and all things that should reset. And usually there should be a bit of a delay on that line. Let me show you what happens when I turn this on. So I'm probing the 556 timer chip, and I have my scope uh, set to roll mode so you can actually see what happens. So this is what happens. It goes high for a second there, after a couple of seconds, and then it goes low again. Basically it goes high when I turn it on and then it goes low. And uh, that signal should be coming in on pin, uh, pin 13, I mean, on the 7406. And it just stays high there. That's not good. And so on pin 12, basically does nothing. <laughs> so we may have a problem with our 7406 there. So here's what it looks like in the schematics. Here's our 556 timer chip, pin nine, signal goes out to pin 13 on our 7406 at U8 and goes out uh, pin 12. And there's the resistor R36. 1K resistor that is connected to the 5 volts here. So uh, the 7406 basically should pull the signal low to uh, make the reset signal, which then is fed into the rest of the circuit, namely the processor mainly. So yeah, that doesn't happen. So this is not strong enough to pull this 5 volt signal down after it gets the signal from the 556. So I may have found the culprit. That would explain why the whole system misbehaves and gives me strange readings. Uh, it doesn't really start up properly because the processor needs uh, some time after it gets its voltage to reset everything. And that's what the reset line is for. Not to worry, we are going to replace this chip and probably that's going to be the solution to our problem here. Next try, new 7406. No! So now it gets a bit dirty. The signal from here should go here. And it doesn't. Why doesn't that go there? Okay. So it just seems that our signal is coming in at pin uh, 9 here on the... 74LS06 and not on pin 13 as is stated in the manual in the schematics. And that, that works fine. Okay, so they are using another uh, circuit in the 7406, I think. Yeah, the schematics are for an early board revision. So we are using pin 9 which has the signal, and I think we're usually using pin 8, with, uh, which has the R36. <laughs> so that was kind of a red herring too. Okay, I take everything back I just said. It's supposed to work like this. Uh, the reset line on the processor is actually supposed to stay high. But there's a delay before it goes high, and when it's high the processor is active. So. There's no problem there. They are just using different output pins on the chip than was set in the schematics. <laughs> and we still get a black screen or the one flash with the dead test. 
Yeah. Okay, so it's uh, very much later in the evening now and I poked around this thing for a couple more hours off camera and actually uh, replaced another logic I see here. But I finally got somewhere by replacing the PLA chip of all things that I tested in my test board and it worked fine. It even booted up uh, basic and things like that. So the system worked fine with this in there. I assume that it didn't make good contact because as you can see the pins, this is the one I desoldered from this machine and uh, yeah, basically the pins are very short because they were cut in this particular board. And yeah, when you have pins like this, they sometimes don't make good contact with certain sockets. It did make good contact or good enough contact to work on the other machine I was testing it in, but not on this one. So that was kind of the issue, the remaining issue. There were a lot of issues, but this one drove me nuts. <laughs> As usual, it was kind of a stupid mistake on my part. I apologize. So now we are at a point with this where we can actually run the dead test. I hope, I hope it still works. <laughs> I had it running. And it takes a couple of seconds to start up. A couple more seconds and then uh, we get an output and we get the dead test running. And that's just, that's just su such a relief. <laughs> I was, this was literally, I thought this would, would be kind of an easy fix. But it turned out to have quite some issues and I didn't figure out this one. And now it even, it even passes through the tests, I think. Let's uh, run this for a while and see if it passes all the tests on the dead test card at least. And of course we can't hear any sound because I don't have the sit in. But otherwise it passes the tests. Hooray! This also starts up without the dead test now. I actually had to replace the kernel ROM that I thought was a working one that I put in here for testing. Again, because it turned out the one I put in from my parts bin broke. It was a tested ROM, but it didn't work anymore. <laughs> Since I tested it, it broke uh, itself, I guess. So now we have the blue screen of life and this thing appears to be fixed. That literally took like two days, two full days to repair this. I actually already tested the SID in my test board and it does work. It makes some strange noises when I turn on the machine and things like that, but I think that might be down to this being the uh, AR version, the R4 AR of the SID. They sound a bit strange. Uh, yeah, let me test this fully, I guess, and play some games and stuff and see if it actually fully works. Yeah, it actually seems like everything is working. Played some games for a couple more hours, kind of to uh, reward me for this repair. And yeah, things like the short pins I've shown you can really ruin your day. And uh, yeah, it's actually the first time that it ruined my day in this way so badly. <laughs> but in the end, it's a good day because another C64 is back in business. And in the end, we had a severely broken kernel ROM. The basic ROM was broken too. I didn't get this to work in my test machine, so I rightly replaced that. And we had a PLA with two short pins. We had several broken RAM chips, actually. I have yet to test all of them. I have, for now, I just put uh, good ones in, in all the positions from my parts bin. At least the one that got really, really hot that was severely shorted. And I think the first one I replaced was also broken. So the reason that the dead test didn't even start up was a shorted kernel ROM, actually. So that can even if the dead test overrides the ROMs, this can actually bring the whole system down and not even allow the dead test to start. Uh, that got hot. You, I could just feel that it got hot. 
And the RAM chip, I think this one got really hot too. So that's a good test actually. Leave the machine on for a couple of minutes, like five minutes or so, and feel if the chips get hot. Um, they do get pretty warm, even if they work, but you can usually, if, if it starts to hurt, that's an indication for the chips being bad, actually. Other than that, I'm pretty happy that I got this working again. As I said, this has been worked on by one of the last repair persons, or the last repair person, who knows, who did this professionally in Germany. And I hope I did Uwe Peters justice with this repair. Probably not. I followed a lot of wrong tracks, but I hope it was an informative video for you watching me doing this, and I hope it was somewhat enjoyable still. Ha! Ah, now on to my second favorite step after testing. Reassembly. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm not a big fan of these uh, cardboard RF shields. And there we go, it's a wrap. Yeah, that's it for this video. I hope you somewhat enjoyed it. I at least enjoy the outcome of this very much. I followed a lot of wrong things and uh, went deep down the rabbit hole and I didn't even have to. But yeah, that's kind of the things that ruin your day are often the most obvious ones. And uh, for me especially, this was another one of those Jan Beta videos. <laughs> I think I shared a lot of information that usually applies to C64 repairs, so probably this is going to be useful to someone, hopefully. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching. Thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon and on the YouTube memberships page. Thank you for your subscriptions and your comments, and I hope to see you on this channel again sometime. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.